Okay, for our next talk, slightly out of order, this is the third talk on the schedule while we wait for the second talk to log on because they're presenting remotely. Uh, I am pleased to introduce Davide Ferre talking about uh, message passing and communication models. Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. And to be honest, also a little anxious because this is my first conference ever. And anyway, today I will talk about um, the work that I did during my master internship under the supervision of Professor Cinzia Di Giusto and Etienne Loz. First of all, I would like to give you a little bit of context uh, on distributed systems and communication. In a distributed system, we have a set of participants, such as processes or devices, that exchange messages. And the way that these messages are exchanged is controlled by the communication model. And uh, uh, broadly speaking, we have two main kinds of communications, which are synchronous communication and fully asynchronous communication. And in synchronous communication, the sending and the receipt of a message are viewed as a single entity, which means that they happen simultaneously. Whereas as soon as we move into the asynchronous world, we decouple the sending of a message from its receipt. And so after a message is sent, uh, we might have that it's received indefinitely after. And so we can have that a process sends a message, and it doesn't have to wait for that message to be received to continue with its other operations. And as you can see from the picture, between synchronous and fully asynchronous communication, we also have a bunch of other variants, uh, which include causally ordered communications. And uh, uh, all of these variants fall under the umbrella term of asynchronous communication. And what's interesting is that uh, as long as we use synchronous communication, we have a finite state space. Uh, which means that we can use the finite state automata to model our system. And as a consequence, most of the interesting properties, such as the reachability of a state, are decidable. However, as soon as we move into the asynchronous world, we encounter an infinite state space. And most of the time, this means that we will deal with Turing equivalent models. And with these Turing equivalent models, those properties that were decidable in the synchronous world become undecidable. And it's for this reason that uh, in the literature, a lot of techniques, approximation techniques, have been proposed to try and recover decidability in this asynchronous context. And uh, our goal was, first of all, to try and formalize all of this mess here. Because uh, several asynchronous communication models have been introduced in the literature, but often, uh, it wasn't really clear which was the difference between some of them. They seemed very, very similar, but there were some, some small differences. And so first of all, we wanted to formalize the spectrum of asynchronous communication. And after we did that, or I hope that we did that, uh, we also provided a framework, which is to say a set of techniques that you can use to derive the decidability of the model checking problem by also taking into consideration the communication model used by the distributed system. And before diving into the content of the paper, I would like to quickly talk about message sequence charts, or MSCs for short, which basically are a graphical representation which is used to uh, represent uh, distributed computation. And they define a partial order over the send and receive events. So for instance, here you can see an example of, of MSC, and each vertical line represents the lifetime of a process or a device in a distributed system. And please uh, pay attention, uh, the time flows from top to bottom, and the blue arrows are used for messages. So here you can see that the process P is sending a message to a process R. And by convention, we use an exclamation mark to denote a send event, and a question mark to denote a receive event. In this case, uh, the one is used as a label for the message. Uh, I've used numbers. Uh, for convenience, but I could have used letters or strings. It doesn't matter, really. And just to give you a, a couple of examples, if we look at the third process, R, you see that the reception of message 1 happens before the sending of message 3, because time flows from top to bottom. And also, the sending of message 3 happens before its reception, which in turn happens before the sending of 4. So. Uh, Adding up all of that, we have that the reception of one happens before the sending of four. Uh, 
However, since an MSC defines a partial order over send and receive events, it's not always possible to compare two events. For instance, if we consider the sending of message 2 and the sending of message 3, these are actually incomparable, they are concurrent, because they are executed by different processes, and we cannot find a path that goes from one process to another by following the message arrows and going down the process lines. So after this small introduction, I will quickly talk about a couple of the communication models that we considered and maybe give you a hint of what they actually are. And please keep in mind that when I say communication model, I mean that thing that defines some constraints on the order in which messages must be sent and received. So here you can see a quick overview of the seven communication models that we considered, ranging from the fully asynchronous communication, which is the less restrictive one, to the RSC, which stands for realizable with synchronous communication, which is very, very close to synchronous communication. And uh, these seven communication models were already considered in this paper called On the Diversity of Asynchronous Communication by Chevreux and others, but they were seen, uh, let's say, under a different light, under a different point of view, which is quite different from ours, and so that led to some different results. So once we formalized all of these seven communication models, and I will talk uh, about just a couple of them, the peer-to-peer -peer and the RSC, uh, one of the interesting questions that might arise is, given an MSC, such as this one in the picture, that represents a distributed computation, is this computation realizable using any of these seven communication models? And for instance, if we know that it's realizable using, let's say, the mailbox communication model, is it always the case that it is also realizable by using any of these other communications? So we wanted to try and establish a kind of hierarchy between these communication models. And here is the first example, which is the 5 for one to one or peer-to-peer -peer communication model, in which for each pair of processes, we have that if a process sends two messages to another process, those two messages must be received in the same order as they were sent. So if you look at this MSC, we have that P sends two messages, uh, one and two to the process Q, and those messages are received in the same order. So this is a valid computation for our peer-to-peer -peer communication model. However, if, if we look at this other example, you see that this is not actually realizable with peer-to-peer -peer because the process queue receives those two messages in the opposite order. And this is actually a case of fully asynchronous communication. I go on with another example, which is the realizable with synchronous communication, which tries to uh, basically mimic the synchronous behavior as close as possible. As I said before, in synchronous communication, we have that the sending and the receiving of a message happen at the same time simultaneously. And in order to explain how this model works, I need to introduce the concept of linearization. If you recall what I said before, when we have an MSC, we basically have a partial order over events. And as any partial order, we can extend it to several different total orders that are compatible with this partial order. And we call those total orders linearizations or linear extensions. Here I give an example. So we have an MSC, which defines a partial order over these events. And here we have a possible linearization of this MSC. You can see, you can think about a linearization as a way to schedule all of the events in an MSC. So for instance, here we send one, then we send message two, we receive one, we receive two, we send three, and then we receive four. Uh, we receive three, sorry. But this is not the only possible linearization. Here we have a second possible linearization in which we send one, then we receive the one, we send two, receive two, send three, and receive three. And you can see that this linearization has a very specific property uh, because each send event is immediately followed by the corresponding receive event. So you see that we send one and we immediately receive one. So we are trying to mimic the synchronous behavior. And this is why it's called realizable with synchronous communication. And after formalizing and studying the relationships between those seven communication models, we came up with this hierarchy. And what this hierarchy tells us is that if, for instance, we consider an MSC which is realizable by using the causally ordered communication, what this hierarchy tells us is that this same behavior could be realized using 
the FIFO one-to-one -one communication or also the fully asynchronous communication. And these results actually proved to be very useful in uh, deriving some decidability results for the model checking problem, which will be the focus of the next section. Of the next section. But before uh, diving into model checking, I would like to quickly uh, talk about how we can take an MSC and interpret it as a graph. So you see, this is very simple. Each event, whether it is a send or a receive event, becomes a node in, uh, in our graph, and each message arrow becomes an arc in our directed graph. And also, if we take subsequent events on a process, they are linked by, by an arc in our graph. And since we are dealing with graphs, we can use tools from the graph theory. For instance, we can use some logic such as monadic second order logic as a specification language over graphs. And here I put a very simple example of a formula which tells us that there exists an event which is a send event from a process P to a process Q of a message with label A. And if we try to evaluate this formula on this MSC right here, you can see that it's true because indeed we are able to find not one, even two messages uh, that are from P to Q with label A. And another tool from graph theory uh, is special true width. Special true width is a, a graph measure that somehow tells us how close the structure of a graph is to the structure of a tree. And unfortunately, I won't have time to explain how it works, but if you're familiar with normal true width, it's pretty similar. So, uh, model checking basically amounts to asking whether all the behaviors of our system when using one communication model are included in a set of MSCs for which an MSO formula or a logic formula is true. And we know it has been proved that this problem becomes decidable if we only consider the behaviors of our system that have a bound on that special true property that I talked to you about before. And this is called bounded model checking. And while this is nice, this is not always that helpful because we might have a scenario such as this one in which we have all the possible behaviors of our system in blue. And out of these behaviors, uh, the orange ones are those with a bounded special true width. But suppose that we now consider a formula for which this is the language. And as you can see, we have that all the bounded behaviors of our system in orange are included in the language of our formula. However, there are still some other behaviors of our system which are not bounded, which lie outside the formula. So even though we have a positive answer to the bounded model checking problem, we have a negative answer to the more general model checking problem. But however, if we know that all the behaviors of our system are bounded, then we can use bounded model checking because it effectively becomes equivalent to model checking. You see here, the blue and the orange set collapse, they become equivalent, and so we can use bounded model checking, which is the side of it. And one way to show that all the behaviors of our system have a bounded special true width is to prove that they are contained in a given class of MSCs, C, which we know is bounded on the special true width property. And what we showed for all the communication models that we considered is that if this class C right here has a bound on the special true width property, and it's also MSO definable, so we are able to find an MSO formula that completely describes it, then this containment problem is decidable. And if the answer to this problem is positive, then it means that we can use model checking on our system because bounded, we can use bounded model checking. And a question that might arise naturally now is, uh, what are some interesting classes C against which we might want to check our system? And what we did in our paper was to consider these four classes, which are respectively weakly synchronous, weakly k-synchronous, existentially k-bounded, and universally k-bounded MSC. Unfortunately, I won't have time to explain them, but just to give you an intuition, they naturally arise from purely synchronous communication. So we started from synchronous communication, and you, you relax some constraints, and you end up with some of these classes. And you can see that we have some parameters here and there, and those parameters basically tells you, tell you how far you are from the synchronous world. For instance, for weekly case synchronous MSCs, 
When k equals 1, we are purely synchronous communication. But as the, parameters, uh, the parameter grows, we move away from synchronous communication. And what we had to do for each of these cells, for example, uh, the class of weekly case synchronous uh, MFCs uh, with fully asynchronous communication, was to try and see if uh, uh, this class was special to with bounded and MSO definable. And if, both we were, if we were able to prove both of those things, then we can say that this containment problem is decidable, and if the answer is positive, model checking is decidable and can be used. And uh, these techniques uh, were already uh, presented in a paper by Bolling and others, which is called a unifying framework for deciding synchronizability, but we extended those framework uh, to work uh, with all the seven communication models, and it, this was quite a lot of work. And in conclusion, I would like to quickly recap uh, the main contributions of our paper and maybe point out some possible future works. You see that we formally defined the seven asynchronous communication models interpreted as a set of MSCs, which remember are a way to represent a distributed computation. And we also studied the relationships between those uh, communication models and came up with this hierarchy, and then exploited this hierarchy to get some decidability results for the model checking problem. And you might, notice, you might have noticed from this big table that there is a question mark here, because we're not able to prove decidability or undecidability for the case of weakly synchronous uh, MSCs when using fully asynchronous communication. So, of course, this is one thing that we would like to investigate in the future. And other stuff that we could do are consider other communication models. Here, for instance, uh, I've put uh, the Mattern and Funfrocken uh, uh, implementation of causal ordering, which is basically a lightweight implementation of causal ordering, which we considered in our work, but that is not exactly the same, so it's slightly different. And we would like to, to know how much is different and what are the differences. And another thing that we could do is consider other logics, such as the first order logic with transitive closure, and what this might give us are some better complexity results for model checking, basically. And finally, uh, one goal would be to, I think, to use these theoretical results to somehow develop some kind of verification tool for concurrent programs. And in this direction, I took a very, very first small step by developing a uh, a web tool, which you can find at this link, where you can draw your own MSCs and see if they can be realizable with any of the asynchronous communication models that we consider. And having said all that, I leave you with a screenshot of the, the web interface. And thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure, and please feel free to ask any question. Enjoy the rest of the conference and lunch. Uh, we definitely have time for questions. Hi, um, thanks so much. I was wondering, uh, what sort of properties are you checking over these models? Or is it just, so I, I'm sort of confused because, you know, typically in model checking you have your model and then you have some property you'd like to check. So what's the property you're checking in these models? Okay, uh, if I let me bring the presentation back up. I might need that. If I understand correctly, you are asking uh, what kind of properties could we check uh, on these models. Uh, actually, um, if you use MSO logic, which is what I presented, uh, you, you can check a, a bunch of property. For instance, I don't know, uh, reachability. You, you, you might check if you, you reach a certain state where uh, a, few, a few conditions apply, and uh, I haven't talked about it, but uh, um, the way that we define the sum of those communication models, fully asynchronous, uh, 5 for one to one etc., was uh, some kind of declarative uh, way in which we gradually added some relations, and then we said, okay, our MSC is 5 for n to one if this relation is a cyclic, so if transitive closure is reflexive, is irreflexive, which is a very similar approach to uh, what was presented before. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is second order logic, and uh, events are interpreted uh, 
the first uh, order variables are interpreted as events, either send or receive events. And you can use a, a bunch of relations that define the relationships between those events. For instance, we have a relation that says that an event occurs before another event in the same process, but we also have a matching relation that says that a send event is related with the corresponding receive event. So you can combine all of those to build some interesting properties, and there are, there are really a lot of things you can do with uh, MSO. Does it answer your question? Yeah, that does. But so, so just to be clear, it's not like you're implementing, like you're not checking like an LTL property. You're just, you, you have you sort of this other logic that you're using to express properties that you're interested in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. yeah, we have time for maybe one more quick one, whoever, whoever was first. Where in your hierarchy of models do you uh, place the non-blocking send and blocking read? Okay, so let me go back. Okay, so where we, we put non-blocking send with blocking read? Okay, I'm gonna have to, to, to think a little about that uh, because if we have non block Sense it means that if we block and read. Uh, yeah, I, I have an idea, but I, I don't want to, to go out on a limb and say something wrong. So uh, I will think about it for, for a few minutes, and after I can, I can get back to you with a, an accurate answer. I don't want to say something wrong. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's thank Davide one more time. Thank you.